back, everybody. Thank you for sharing your lunch hour with us. Um, that was a fantastic preparation this morning for the conversation we're going to have now. Um, and I was particularly struck by the notion of the role that audience engagement plays in, in information and misinformation. So we're going to be talking a little more about that. Um, we have some of the best journalists in the field sitting here with us today. Um, so we had a, a bit of a top level conversation earlier. Now we're going to get straight into the details of what it takes to actually do the kind of reliable, accurate reporting on infectious diseases. Um, what we're going to do is that we'll hear briefly from each of our speakers. And we have Micheline with us on Skype, as you can see. So I'll, I'll introduce everybody. Um, we have Karen Weintraub right, sitting right next to me. Um, acclaimed freelance journalist, health and science writer, has had a long career, works for USA Today, New York Times, Washington Post, Stat, you know, has um, sort of covered a wide array of issues. Also teaches at Boston University and the Harvard Extension School. So thank you for being with us, Karen. We have Lena Sun from the Washington Post, who's a national reporter focusing on health. Um, and we also have Helen Branswell, um, who used to be the health and infectious disease specialist at Canadian Press and has now been with that for how long? Three years. Three years. Wow, it's been a long time. Um, and then we have Micheline Duclef with us from NPR. Hi, Micheline. Hi. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can Fantastic. hear you. Can you hear me? Okay. So, Micheline. Um, is a national reporter and does a lot of work both on the radio and online for Goats and Soda, which is NPR's global health and development news outlet. It's funded by the Gates Foundation. And part of what we're going to touch on today um, is also how we're paying for these kinds of news. So I've talked with each of our panelists to uh, not just talk about what does it take to um, get the best information from sources and you know how to verify on social media, but also to share a little bit of how the sausage is made in journalism. So I'm going to hand it over to Karen to get us started. Great. Thanks. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, I just wanted to start by giving a little bit of context about our readers. So this statistic, I think it's from Pew, um, has, has stuck with me for a long time, these couple of statistics. 46% of Americans believe that God created humans in their present form within the last 10,000 years. 26% can't correctly answer the question, does the sun revolve around the earth or the earth around the sun? And in 2014, only about half of Americans were confident that vaccines are safe and effective, which is about the same percentage as believe in ghosts. So. Our readership, listeners, whatever, um, really, they don't have any background in science. They don't understand why evidence matters. Uh, they haven't been trained. They're not stupid. They just don't, they weren't taught, as, as you were saying in the last panel. It's not only media education, it's also science education. They don't understand basics. Um, but they do care and they do go to the internet for science and health topics. Um, Science is actually, uh, health and science, 37% of the public goes to the internet for health and science topics, and only 23% for sports, so we top sports, uh, and 14% for the arts, which is kind of sad. Um, and then also just wanted to say a little bit about the industry uh, that we work in, which has been changing dramatically for most of my career, actually. Um, but just since 2006, revenue for professional news gathering is down by a third. So imagine an industry that's fallen by a third in 10 years, and it was already headed south before then. Uh, employment is off 23% in roughly the same time period. Newspaper employment over the same period, 45% decline. Um, and uh, we don't have a business model <laughs> anymore. As they were referencing in the last panel, um, ads are gone, subscriptions are, are way down, um, and so we're depending on, on rich people and foundations uh, and what little we can get from, from the internet. Um, also just wanted to say that uh, I, I'm freelance, so maybe it's a little different for staff, but journalists day to day used to be you could have a lot of time to work on a story, and that's not true anymore. Um, I just cataloged the number of stories I, I worked on in the first two weeks of September. It was particularly busy, but I counted um, 12 stories, everything from uh, predicting death 
how uh, the science of predicting death to a seal die off in New England, to coral epigenetics, to anti, several anti-aging stories, nutritional supplement story, sleeping in the nude, that was a fun one, uh, the ketogenic diet, uh, you know, so I'm all over the place covering all sorts of topics. Public health is something I care about passionately, but I don't write about it that often because people don't pay me to write about it very often. Um, they, the tendency is to care about it only when it affects Americans, uh, primarily on American soil. So uh, I, I'm in a climate where I would love to write more about this, but, uh, but struggle to do that. So that's the background Thank I Thank you so to. much, Karen. My name is Lena Sun, as Stephanie introduced, so I have a little bit of a different perspective. I'm on staff at the Washington Post, which is one of the legacy newspapers. We have had an infusion of money. We are owned by Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, and that has made a big difference because a few years ago during the um, recession, we were all worried about layoffs, and cutting is not the way to quality journalism. We have not cut. In fact, we've added hundreds and hundreds of journalists to the newsroom, and uh, people will ask, do you feel the long reach of Bezos? And we only, I, I, we only feel it in the um, financial resources. It does not get involved on the editorial side. Um, at the Washington Post, there are about eight uh, reporters who do health and science, I'm included in that pod, um, and five who do energy and environment. We are all part of the national staff. Um, and we travel in the US and abroad, and we write a mix of daily stories and longer pieces, um, sort of depending on the news. Um, I, uh, unlike Karen, I have not written that much in the last couple of weeks because I was fortunate enough to go on a reporting assignment out of the country for two weeks, and it was great because I had no Wi-Fi and no internet and no electricity, and I could just do what I really wanted to do, which was report from the ground. Um, we, uh, what we write depends on the flow of the news. Um, if there's a big ongoing outbreak, for example, Ebola or Zika or even last year's bad flu, you will see I will write more stories. Oh, I should say I focus on public health and I often write about infectious diseases. Um, not so much those incremental studies um, that tell you what is happening in this phase or that phase. Um, within this context, the challenges for us are to help make readers understand what's going on in this very fast-paced world, to explore issues, to write about the people that these health issues affect, and to write about those, those tensions. And, um, doing that is very hard now, given the climate that we live in, where there is so, mis so much misinformation out there, and everybody and their brother is a health blogger, as you heard earlier. One of the biggest obstacles for us who are doing it in the real world is getting access to accurate information. There is an outbreak. Who knows about what's going on? You need that fast, and you need it accurately. But government bureaucracy is slow, uh, hospital bureaucracy is often even slower. Um, I just want to talk briefly about two stories that I did last year, both of which took um, more than several days to illustrate some of the difficulties and also some of the opportunities. One had to do with the Minnesota measles outbreak in uh, Minneapolis, which Mike mentioned. Um, that was the state's worst measles outbreak in decades, and it was started by uh, this anti-vaccine advocacy group, Andrew Wakefield, um, and the Somali Americans who listened to that information then did not vaccinate their children. Um, but to go beyond just sort of this many cases, that many cases, I really wanted to talk to Somali American parents. That's a very big high bar. During in the middle of an outbreak, parents don't want to talk to you, especially in this community where there was no trust. But I was lucky enough to work with some very dedicated infectious disease doctors at the main children's hospital to meet parents. And then on the afternoon before I left to go back to Washington, this mother agreed to talk to me. And after speaking with her for several hours, she let me talk to her on the record. And then after more talking, she let me go to her house and we could photograph her children. And it was a very power, it was a front page story and online as well, it was a very powerful photo of this woman with her hot pink hijab uh, holding her two children, both of whom had been sick because they did not get um, the, the vaccination. The second story was about a trip 
that I took last year to Congo um, to go with the CDC where they went on an investigation for this very rare and you know, deadly virus called monkeypox. And it was a trip that took, um, it took us, we could only reach it by boat. It was deep in the forest. It was a nine hour boat trip back, a six hour boat trip up. And it was just focusing on this, their search. I think there, that there's some gorgeous photos of our, from the photographer. Um, so we spent a week camping um, in this village and living in a tent while the scientists searched the trapped animals to determine what is the natural reservoir for a monkeypox. In other words, what's the animal that carries this virus um, and makes people sick but doesn't make the animals sick. Um, and uh, everybody thought, oh, this is just in Africa or it doesn't go very rarely elsewhere. But guess what? Earlier this month, um, Monkeypox arrived in the UK. Um, now a third person is sick. It's a medical worker who has been diagnosed and um, had been taking care of other patients. And it shows you a couple of things, how quickly the virus can travel around the world and um, how a lot of what we do as journalists is very similar to what scientists and epidemiologists do, which is to ask a lot of questions to get at the truth. And good journalism, like good science, is difficult, but it's important. So I'm just going to stop there. Thank you so much, Lena. So Michaeline is going to be next. Let me just get you back on the main screen. Here you are, Michaeline. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, great. So I'm Michaeline Duclef. I am uh, actually got promoted recently. I'm a correspondent at NPR. Um, I'm, I'm on the, the Goats and Soda team, as um, Stephanie mentioned, and I just want to tell you a little bit about that and like what that is. So NPR has been funded by the Gates Foundation to cover global health uh, for six years. Um, I've been on that original team starting then. But four years ago, they gave us a giant infusion of money um, to build a really big team. And so we now have about seven or eight people that are devoted solely to global health and development, including reporters, editors, and a few visual people. Um, and our stated goal publicly and from the Gates Foundation um, is to get people to care. So to get the Americans, like uh, uh, Karen said, you know, most people care about what's happening on US soil um, to, to Americans. And the Gates Foundation wants people to care more about people all the way around the world, people that I like, I, I like to say, like black and brown people around the world that are far away. Um, and so we've thought very carefully about how to do this um, because it's hard. It's a really hard mandate. Um, but what we've tried to do is make it very personal, um, bring people's personal stories to stories that you usually just hear numbers about, like poverty and tuberculosis and you know, things that Americans don't relate to very well. We try to make them relatable through people's stories, as well as through like quirky science, quirky ideas. Um, so we have these, I, I kind of call, um, we put the spinach inside the cake. So we have this cake around what we think of as some type of lesson or some type, something that's valuable for Americans. We're kind of tricking, getting them to read. Um, for me as a scientist, and for me specifically, I, I focus a lot on infectious diseases. So I was trained as a biophysicist, um, and for me, I, I love what I do. I love getting people excited about infectious diseases and pathogens. And for me, waking up every morning and just, you know, I'm excited to learn, like, what's, what's new in science? What's going to be the new disease that's going to pop up or the new trick that the disease is doing to, uh, to subdue our immune system? I just get super excited about that. Um, but the challenge is on that front um, is to present it in a way that gets people intrigued and interested, but not uh, afraid. Um, and so we work really hard to try to balance this, right? Like if nobody reads your story, then it, it, it can't really do anything. But at the same time, we don't want to present a very hot and heated topic like an Ebola outbreak um, in a way that causes fear or increases controversy. Um, and so a lot of times what we'll do is we'll actually do the opposite, is we'll take the stories that are causing fear and um, alarmism and we'll try to, we will look at the numbers and look at the data and, and try to debunk that or bring it back down to earth and say like, well, what really does um, 
what do what does the data say? So, for instance, during the Ebola outbreak in 2014-15, um, you know, when Ebola came to the U.S., there was like hysteria on many levels. And um, one of the stories that I wrote was called "So Seriously, How Contagious Is Ebola?" And what I did was actually just describe what the R naught is of virus of a disease, and then looked at like, well, where, what's Ebola, and how does that compare to say measles or HIV? Um, and it was an incredibly popular post. It, I think it ended up having like 2 million views and being like one of the most popular posts at NPR that year. Um, but it was seriously that simple. It was like seriously just taking one simple, one simple idea in epidemiology and making a whole story around it and really informing the public like, hey, here's why we don't need to be so crazy. <laughs> and we can think about this in a really, in a really reasonable way. Um, but engagement is a really hard thing for us. Um, I can give you some idea of like our story numbers, you know, in general, a straight global health development story will probably get something like 10,000 views, maybe more. Um, that's why we work, we work really hard to try to package it in a way, um, tell it in a way that brings more people in because we can't, can't make a living with 10,000 views. And it's just what, I mean, what's the point of that, right? Like, um, we, we really are here to try to provide high valuable, high quality information to the general public. And, and 10,000 views, we don't see that as doing our job. So sometimes we get criticized at Puts and Sodas for, for maybe being too gimmicky, maybe um, portraying things in a way that other people don't really agree with. But I think what we say is that we're really trying to humanize the topics. We're really trying to present them in new ways to draw people in and make and get people um, not only interested but appreciative of other of other cultures. Um, I'm trying to think, is that Stephanie? Is, there, is that pretty good? Or do you want yes, to say anything that, else? You that's want fantastic. To that? Yes, thank okay. you, Michelin. And we'll come back with questions. We'll just hear from Helen first. Hi. So uh, Stephanie mentioned earlier. Um, I started. I've been a reporter for decades, and a lot of that time I wasn't uh, a medical reporter. I did general news and politics and all sorts of other things. Uh, and in 2000, I got assigned to the health beat at the Canadian Press, which was very broad. I had to do anything health-related that came down the pike, and I was a, a department of one. So I was pretty much doing the latest cancer study and uh, you know whatever else was happening. And then in 2003, SARS hit Toronto, which was where I happened to live. I mean, SARS hit a bunch of places, but I happened to be at one of the ground zeros, and I'd never covered an outbreak before, had no clue what an r naught was. The first time I really knew anything about that was Mark Glipsich taught me about that. Um, and I was hooked. I found it fascinating. It was exciting. It was this interesting mix of health and news. Like you had to, it, it was a news story with, it was health wrapped up in a news story. And I knew how to in, um, cover a news story. And so I really liked that combination. And uh, in the years since, I have tried to focus on infectious diseases when I can. I haven't always been able to do it exclusively. I'm currently at STAT. I have been for three years. And there my beat is um, infectious diseases and global health, which is kind of um, the biggest luxury I can imagine as a journalist. <laughs> um, and you know, there I write about flu. And this morning I was writing about you know what is monkeypox and uh, also could HIV transmission actually be stopped? And I don't know what I'll be doing tomorrow, but it'll be something. I don't write as many stories these days as Karen does. I don't write as few as you <laughs> do. I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I, um, I think one of the things Stephanie wanted me to focus on was the fact that I typically don't travel. Uh, it's not because I have an aversion to it. I like to do it in my own time, but at the Canadian press, there was no money for me to go to any of the places that you know these stories were happening in. So I learned other ways into the story. For instance, with Ebola, one of the reasons I started writing about that a lot was because a lot of the um, work on therapeutics and vaccines was done at Canada's National Lab in Winnipeg. In fact, the vaccine that's currently being used in 
West Africa, or not West Africa, excuse me, and DRC was designed at Canada's National Lab. So I wrote about the science of Ebola, and that sort of drew me into coverage of outbreaks in the ways that I can. I can't obviously talk about what things are happening on the ground in detail or how it's affecting people, like individual people, but I can talk about trends and I can talk about the way an outbreak is going and, and sort of project about what the problems might be or um, uh, whether things are going well or badly. And I would say right now they're going badly. Um, uh, so, like I said, I think I'm probably one of the luckiest journalists around, and I might just leave it there. Well, Holland, give us a little bit of background on STAT, and sort of what is it? Okay, what, so, what does it do? good point. Um, STAT was started three years ago. I mean, three years ago this month, I started working in Boston, um, and we went live on November 4th of 2015. It is sort of an offshoot of the Boston Globe. We are not a division of the Boston Globe, but we are owned by Boston Globe Media Partners. Um, we are online, we cover health. Uh, we share content too with the Globe, so if they want any of our stories, they can print them in the paper, but our main home is online. We cover health broadly, uh, these days a little less broadly than we did when we started. When we started, we sort of cast a very wide, you know, took a big, big frame. And um, as we've sort of worked to find our audience and um, get to sustainability, because, you know, you, ha you have to break even, um, we have sort of narrowed the focus some as a reflection of the interests of the people who actually will pay to read stat, which is a growing number, but you know, we're still working on it. www.statnews.com. <laughs> and you all need to subscribe if you want to save journalism. <laughs> Goes for everybody. Um, yeah. Goes for everybody. Pay yes. for news. Pay for so news. Nico started us off this morning, right, with the comparison to how the journalism industry has decree decreased to an even larger extent than the steel industry. Um, and, and part of what we have represented here, right, when you put together a conversation like this, you can't have all the people who no longer work in the field. Right? Um, so we're pretty blessed. And I'm also obviously super excited to have an all-women panel. Um, which is fantastic, right? <laughs> yeah. I think there'll be a manual tomorrow, so whatever the, the female <laughs> version of that is will be today. Um, but Lena, I'm wondering if you could um, share a little bit. And the reason why I'm, I want to dwell on this just a little bit is because if we, we, we see that part of the, the connection between um, traditional journalism and junk news is audience engagement, right? And for, for everybody who is still in traditional media, audience engagement is sort of the bread and butter right now. We need to find out how to get people to come to these sites and to consume our work so that, that we can continue to pay for it. So Lena, I was going to ask you to, to talk a little bit, if you can, about how the Washington Post thinks about this and, and what that means for you specifically in terms of covering these diseases. So audience engagement is foremost at, um, at the leadership of my news organization. If you come to the Washington Post these days, the main newsroom is this big hub, high open ceiling area, and across the one, one side of the news, one side of the, of the of hanging from the top is this enormous screen, tells you in real time what everybody is reading, and you see how that curve goes up in the morning, it spikes around noon, and it comes down in the afternoon, and it picks up again in the evening. At any one time, it'll show you what is the top story. So um, obviously during the election, Trump-related stuff, but you remember when that man was pulled off the United Airlines flight? Right, everybody remembers that story? There were so many people reading about that, that was even above the homepage, it was way at the top of the screen. And it is something that um, we have all these different teams of metrics and people know when you read the story, at what point in the story you're dropping off, what kinds of stories interest you. And as everybody has said, there is no business model for us in journalism, right? We don't know what is the best way to work. 
Um, at the Post, um, we try to do the best journalism, hold people accountable, and um, but they do also want to get subscribers because our print edition is, you know, used to be way up here when I first started and it's slowly eking out. And at some point, there won't be a print edition, but right now there is. Um, they want digital subscribers. And what do digital subscribers want to read? They don't want to read the clickbait about the dancing bears or the shark in the street or the latest whatever. They care about Roy Moore and what his past was. They care about the Russia investigation. They care about the deeply reported stories that take a lot of resources to do, but which um, the Post and a bunch of other places are still committed to doing. And um, the Congo story that I told you, uh, I was out of the office for a week and a, oh, over a week, the photographer, then it was custom designed, not just to appear on the Washington Post site, but also on the Apple News site to reach a broader audience. And it had a very strong engagement. And over 20% of the people who engaged with that were digital subscribers. And that's the holy grail. Um, it is tough. When I first started in journalism decades ago, very different tempo to my day. I had one deadline in the afternoon, um, and not anymore. Um, I may not write as much as these guys, but I'm, I have to monitor Twitter and all these other social media streams, and I have to be aware of all our other platforms. We have something that we've launched, The Lily, to try to reach young women. Um, all of the Washington Post um, photographs and bios of reporters are now um, uniform, so people know who we are because you combat disinformation by providing transparency. We try to include as many links as possible to the actual government documents or reports so people know that we're credible when we're citing the information. Um, we try to explain in the story how we got the information. Um, and we also try to appeal in as many ways as possible to all the different platforms. Instagram, we started something called Stamp, which is only to be viewed on the mobile phone in a vertical mode, and it's very visual images with just a little bit of text. So for the wildfire story, you know, um, and take Washington Post journalism and to, to get reach, reach a broader audience. Um, and we are in the black, which is great, um, and we're just hoping that this will continue. Fantastic. Thank you, Lena. So let's move over a little bit to um, specifically covering infectious diseases. Um, could, could you share with us, and I'll, I'll let you take the question, Michaeline, you, you two, um, what, what makes this a heartbeat? What, what are some of the things that you, know, you, you struggle with as you? The queen of infectious diseases <laughs> would be Helen. I didn't say it. I said it. Um, I guess the hardest thing is that when something becomes really big, everybody jumps on and it's really hard to find people to talk to. You know, I have good, I have a good uh, electronic Rolodex, but um, when everybody in the world is trying to talk to the same 10 or 20 people, it's just really hard to get through sometimes. And that, you know, I can know a lot of flu scientists, but in, you know, April and early May of 20, uh, 2009, it was really hard to get anybody on the phone. And, and that, I think, that, that's, that's the challenge that would come to mind for me. Do you get, sorry, just a follow-up question, do you get booted out for if um, Good Morning America or, or some big network, you know, wants to put somebody <laughs> on or wants to have? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that, I, I imagine that does happen. You just get a different time, you know? It's like, oh, he's not available yet. He'll be available a little later, yeah. I would like to say that on the briefings for the WHO, Helen is always the first one <laughs> to get picked on for the question. <laughs> that is, they, they don't pick me. I get on and I, I dial in the code immediately. That's the secret. <laughs> But I think in general, for we were talking about news and how quickly and, and trustworthiness, right? So we 
we don't know independently how big the thing is or who the index case was or where it started or how contagious. We have to rely on the folks who are most in charge and most knowledgeable. And there is a huge lag between government understanding um, or, or even a bureau bureaucracy's understanding of that need. Um, if you go to any sort of simulations of pandemics or epidemics, um, there's a lot of stuff about who's in the room. Just on a regular basis, getting information from the CDC has to clear so many different levels for a non-controversial thing. Yeah. So God forbid what they will do when we have a real epidemic, a real pandemic, which of course we will. So this morning, sorry, but this morning the, when uh, the Public Health England announced that they had a third case of monkeypox, that a healthcare worker there had contracted it from one of these two imported cases, I, you know, my editor has been sort of watching the monkeypox thing and he said, you know, the next time there's a case, you're going to have to write. And so I got an email at five after seven this morning saying, I think it's time to write about monkeypox. And I said, okay, but you have me for about three hours this morning, so I can only do X. I was going to do like a Q&A. And I reached out immediately to a very good uh, public information officer at the CDC, who you will know who I'm talking about, yes. who's excellent at his job, and said, you know, can I get somebody fast? I need it this morning. I need it, uh, you know, before 10. I have to write this story because then I have to go to this panel. And he just got back to me and said, I, the clearances would never come through in that time frame. Sorry. If you need it on the record, it won't happen. Yeah. Didn't and, happen. Yep. So they, you know, this is, this is, just like one small microcosm of what it's like in the U.S. government, right? This is the agency so that, and it's, it's, it, it's the agency that's in charge, and this is, this is not even that big a deal, yeah. right? So, um, so there's that frustration. In the meanwhile, um, you could imagine a scenario where some not reputable, junky kind of site is taking rumors from what the nurse overheard in the hallway telling her boyfriend, and off it goes, and then you have, you know, hysteria. Yeah. Aaron, do you have? Can I say something about that? Sorry. Yes. <laughs> I think for me, coming from from a scientist, so I spent seven years in academia, and then I switched to this crazy media world. For me, the hardest part of this is um, the politicalization. Is that a word? The politics mm -hmm. that gets involved with the science. So during these outbreaks, like the Zika. Um, sticks out in my mind there was a lot of politics mixed in with like what the CDC was telling us and it wasn't always just what the data were saying it there was you always kind of have to read between the lines like what are what is their political agenda um, and how does that sway what they're saying and as a scientist that was that's really hard for me it still is um, because it's like I want to know what's going on I want to know what the kind of the facts are and we don't all we don't as reporters always get that from government agencies and um, pharmaceutical companies and scientists, I think are a little bit more straightforward, but they have their own biases. But um, for me, but that's been really hard. It's like you, even when you get the CDC, I'm always a little bit like, you know, what is the, their, their agenda? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michaeline. So my perspective is a little bit different, again, as a freelancer. Um, I covered Ebola for National Geographic uh, and their part of their motivation is always to showcase their fabulous photography, uh, which I, I actually love. My stories looked fabulous on that website because they had such gorgeous pictures. But um, so I wasn't trying to be the definitive reporter on that story. I was trying to take kind of a, a more perspective step back angle, which is pretty hard from my living room in Cambridge um, to do about West Africa. Um, so I spent a lot of time uh, trying to, to track people down in the real world uh, on the ground there. Um, and one story I ended up being really proud of, but it took me forever to try to, um, I, d I did a piece about orphans, the, the kids who'd been orphaned um, by, by this horrible epidemic. And um, I ended up finding a family who had taken in this this kid from who'd been there across uh, who'd been their neighbor and the mother the parent the mother died um, and their neighbor took them in and it was really a very moving story to me but it was quite challenging they had these um, Liberians uh, they had this very thick accent <laughs> they spoke English but I was on the phone and I was oh my God what are you saying I have no idea uh, so it took me a little while the interviewing was really challenging uh, but it ended up being a story I was really uh, mm -hmm. I thought added 
to, to the discussion um, and really enjoyed doing. Fantastic. So. And, and we had earlier a question about international reporting and when we, we had a, a history of science conversation last night about these types of perspectives. Um, so, Michaeline, I'm actually going to ask you, and being an international journalist myself, I, you know, have spent a lot of time thinking about um, the implosion within journalism obviously also leads to way fewer people on the ground to do mm -hmm. these kinds of stories. And then at the same time, people like Helen and you, you've all shown us that there are workarounds for these. Um, but exactly, right, there's sort of a shake of a head, right? So, Michaeline, I think you have a, sh a story to tell about um, covering Ebola first from here and then being able to go and do on the ground reporting. Um, yes. So, yeah. When I first started working on the Ebola outbreak at the beginning, like we were on it really early, um, like February, March, of, uh, of Fabia, who was in West Africa, alerted us to it. And um, for about the first six months, seven months of it, I was at my desk in San Francisco, where I am right now, you know, covering the science of it, which was really exciting and really interesting. And I, I, I think I made really good contributions to the to the coverage. Um, but then in October, actually, NPR was asking for volunteers to go. We actually, people actually didn't want to go. It was like people wanted to, to, to kind of stay away from, from the outbreak. Um, and the people that had gone had been many times, and we were trying to keep people fresh. And so I actually volunteered. I was like, I want to go. I definitely want to go. My husband thought I was crazy. He didn't want me to go. Um, and, and, and it really changed how I thought about the epidemic in my mind, it completely shifted because when I left here in San Francisco, it was October and it was just when Ebola had come to Dallas and Chris Christie was quarantining people, quarantining the nurse and the MSF doctor was getting diagnosed. And there was this like kind of mass hysteria here in the US. And then when I fly to Monrovia, it was like, there was like no hysteria. So, so there was like, I come from the place where there's you know, three or four cases, the place where the outbreak is peaking with thousands and thousands of cases. And people were just moving on with their lives. People were getting their hair cut and hanging out at, you know, uh, bars and watching soccer. And, um, and it was just this really different um, experience. It was like, wow, what we see in the news every day is really not representative of what is actually going on in these places a lot of times. Um, so it was a really um, has had a profound impact on on my thinking of outbreaks, um, and we actually turned that into a story. So like we wanted to show this right that like um, that the, that this this hysteria was not there that people's lives people were moving on with their lives and there was a big there was a normalcy there that really wasn't represented in the in the coverage that we were seeing um, on the outbreak. So. Um, it, it, it shifted my way of thinking about it, but but it also helped to like personalize the, the outbreak. You know, talk, talk, like talking, like Lena said, to the moms, to the to the families. You you, you I think you are able more to then uh, present them in a way that's very um, relatable and and uh, and human. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Lena, do you have anything to add about how being able to do the monkeypox story has changed your approach? I, I just think that even before monkeypox, I was the uh, Beijing bureau chief for the Washington Post, also a long time ago. Um, and um, there is something about being reporting on the ground that is so much more satisfying, and especially for um, our particularly insular group of Americans who grow up thinking that you know the world is only about 26 kinds of Pringles potato chips and <laughs> only speak one language, that it's so important for us as journalists to be able to report from uh, other places to let Americans see, you know, pull pull the pull back the blinds. And the other part of it is that what we were doing in Congo was very basic science. But the logistics were just incredible. You know, you could only reach this village by boat. And once we got there, um, you know, we had to cut down the bamboo uh, from the forest to build the lab. Then they had to go into the forest every day to build the traps to get the animals. Um, 
uh, they had to hire a local woman to cook the meal. A goat would walk by, and then that goat would be your dinner. <laughs> but there was only one meal a day. There was no showers. The, but with the incredible equanimity and composure and not missing a beat um, when the boat broke or whatever, this is what science does every day. And it was really it was great to be able to show that to, um, to Americans as well. Thank you, Lina. So I'll ask one more question, and then I'll hand it over to you. So please get ready to ask. I know you have lots of questions for our colleagues. Um, there, so already in the last two days of outbreak week, there have been a lot of references to the media. And I was grateful for Michael earlier to you know, start explaining that it's a little more complex than you know, the, this, this one enemy of the people. Um, <laughs> So if, if there was one thing you could tell people that, or that you wish people knew about your job or about journalism and, and how, you know, how we do what we do, what would it be? We don't make it up. <laughs> yeah. We try really hard. It is really hard to get people to talk to you for certain subjects. And we keep trying. And sometimes we can do it in the time that we have. Yeah. And sometimes we can't. And in the time that we, we have deadlines, where we have to write a story within two hours because we need to answer those questions, that is why we, we try the best so we only have one source or two sources or not everybody is named or it's not the perfect person. You know, it's not perfect. We do the best we can. Yeah. Yeah, I would also say, you know, all journalists make mistakes. All humans make mistakes. We hate making mistakes. We do it. We hate it. We fix them if you tell us about them. Um, you know, I yeah. always, yeah, yeah, exactly. I always tell people, um, sometimes we get asked, you know, will you show us your story and the story in advance? And it's like, no, we don't do that. But I'll send you a link as soon as it's up. And if you see anything wrong, get back to me, tell me, we'll fix it. Get back to me as soon as possible, because the sooner it's down or fixed, the, the, the better it is. You don't want to leave mistakes up, because mistakes engender more mistakes. Uh, but you know, we don't try to make mistakes. We try to be perfectly accurate. <laughs> Michaeline, do you have? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I try to point out to people that we are writing for like a ginormous range of abilities and um, informedness, is that a word, right? So like I'm writing, I always think like I'm writing a story that my mom, who is like knows nothing about diseases, can understand, um, take something from, maybe enjoy, to you know my colleagues at UC Berkeley who study dengue virus. I want to write a story for both of those people. And that's an incredibly hard thing to do. And maybe we miss it. And maybe we miss some of the people in between. Um, but I, we, I am definitely trying my best um, to, to, to strike a good medium and to, to, to give you something that's, that's useful, factual, and, um, and that you want to read. Um, so, so yeah, we, just keep in mind that not every sentence in there is written for the expert. <laughs> um, and that sometimes that means generalizing things to a level that people get upset about, mm. I think. Can I just add something to that? Mm -hmm. Not every story, or no story can contain all the facts. That's, that's another thing. It's like, well, why didn't you mention this? It's like, because it's 800 words. You know, I can only mention so much in 800 words. So questions? Karen? Oh, sorry, Karen. It's fine. Go ahead. No, no, it's fine. Hi, I'm, um, I'm Leo Liu. I'm one of the editors and uh, moderator for ProMed Mail, a uh, program for monitoring emerging diseases. And, um, in covering the uh, Ebola outbreaks in the DRC this year, uh, we've had several instances where cases of hemorrhagic fever were reported in other countries like Uganda, Tanzania, Zambia, and so forth. And I think in every case, they, they turned out to be you know, something else, mainly Congo crying cry, and hemorrhagic yeah. fever. So, so setting aside the fact that you know, this other very serious illness is simply discounted as a false alarm in the context of Ebola, I mean, this is a literal example of, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, I guess. So for, for those of you who are doing, you know, on the ground electronic reportering, how do you, how do you strike a balance between 
uh, when you filter through these primary reports coming through social media and so forth between the sort of, um, you know, being quick versus uh, being accurate? And do you have your own policy? I mean, we've sort of learned to just wait a day or two to see if there's confirmation rather than jumping on this and reporting it right away. <laughs> Those of you read that um, this morning. You know, sometimes waiting a day or two is not generally an option if you're in the daily media. Um, but I, I'm blanking on what it was, but very recently there was something and people were reporting and it's like, uh, we don't really feel like it's 100% solid, haven't got confirmation. We did hold off, you know, an hour or two, which is, I guess, maybe our version of, a, you know, a day or two. Uh, and eventually, when it became clear that yes, this was real, we st I started writing. Um, you know, you just have to do the best you can, assess the where the information is coming from, how much you trust the information sources. I, I think every news organization again has its own, you know, barometer, mm -hmm. and um, you know. Um, we are not, we have not been writing about or reporting about the Ebola outbreak in DRC daily, right? It, we're waiting for when there's a significant development, there was a significant development, you know, it's gotten better, it's gotten worse, now it seems to be getting worse again. And um, uh, the, the level of competition for news and attention at the Washington Post right now <laughs> you can sort of imagine, right? So it, it's, it, and, and for our readers as well. So it, it's, it's just, you use your best judgment. I did make the argument f to our Africa reporter that it seemed like things were getting worse now um, in Congo, and it was time to write something to take note of that fact. And so we had, so we had a story. I can, I can add a little bit. Um, so we feel like with it over the last, that we have a really good, um, sources on the ground, places that we kind of, that we go to. So for instance, there was something bubbling up on OMED mail recently about some, some new disease in Haiti. And um, oh, yeah. it was, it was a very vague thing that like popped up on social media. And so we just emailed our sources, you know, that we know that are really reliable there and said, Hey, what is this? What's going on there? Is this something real? And, you know, they got back to us and said, you know, we don't think this is anything really. We'll let you know. So, I mean, I think having like really super reliable people that are there, working there, and know um, the, the lay of the land and what's going on is, is like invaluable on this front to kind of weed out and filter out the hype. I guess I'll, I'll jump in here that that's one of the areas where being a freelancer is yeah. particularly challenging because I don't have that institutional support. I'm basically totally alone when I report a story, right. and my editor has. General, I can't think of an editor I've worked for who really ha who has more expertise than I do, and I don't have that much. So uh, it's it's a challenge. Um, and again, I'm not right. covering the way Helen is, you know, on, on a daily basis. But but I'm not covering it. I the way right. like I tweet Nobody about does, right. the Ebola outbreak a ton, right. but I'm yeah, not right. writing about right. it daily. I, I haven't written her. about it in about a week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and I would just say on you know in in reply to all this that. McLean and, and Lena sort of both come from outfits that have a lot of resources and a lot of reach. You have an Africa correspondent. You guys have Africa correspondents and contacts in Haiti. Uh, many news outlets don't have that. They are standalones. Uh, Stat is a standalone. And, you know, so I may have a few more resources than Karen does, but, but we don't have a network of people we can go to internationally. Which is why I've talked to some people in this room. <laughs> I hate asking a question, but I'm going to. Just because I have spoken to every one of you um, about, actually probably about Ebola, but probably about other topics as well. And one of the things I wonder about is each of you has developed so much expertise that a bunch of times when we're talking on the phone, I want to turn around and say, what do you think of this, Helen? <laughs> like, Lena, do you think this is going to go in a certain And so the question is, how do you as a journalist play the ball of I'm calling the balls and strikes, I'm talking to the experts, versus the fact is you guys all have more expertise than most experts on most of these topics because you've been thinking about this and writing about this for a long time. So how do you weigh your personal expertise and experience versus the experts? I realize you can't quote yourself in those stories because you are journalists, but was that a struggle? Is that an issue you grapple with and how do you do it? 
I just think it helps you frame the story. Yeah. Like, you know, I, if somebody's telling me something that I know is patently untrue, then it's just like, okay, that's not a good, that person's not a good resource for this information. It helps me see what the story I should be writing versus the story that maybe other people are writing. You know, like I can listen to a briefing sometimes and hear people talking about things and I think, okay, so, but what I, what's really important here is the trend is going this way or that way and that it just helps you figure out how to take an approach that maybe not everybody else is taking. Right. It's about framing. Also, then you can pick and choose. Well, that is, that's actually not the story. That's not what I want to spend my time doing mm -hmm. because I've, there's nothing new in what these people have said. It's the same old, same old stuff. Yeah, so I mean, for me, I see it as like the best stories I write and the best reporting I do is when I can understand all the like details like so clearly, all the puzzle pieces like are falling into place in my mind. And then that enables me to step back and write something that's really broad and, and um, generalizable. Um, so yeah, I see it. And for radio being really, really, having a lot of deep understanding is really bad. And I have to like fake that I don't understand things to get people to say things in a simple way. Because the radio needs to be super, super simple. So I've struggled with that. Like pretending to be really dumb when I talk to people on the phone, but, um, <laughs> no, I'm serious. It took a while, but, um, but, but for me, I see it as a real asset to have all those puzzle pieces in place because then you can make like more general, broader statements. You can't make if you don't understand it. That's how, that, that's how I, I see it. I see it as an asset. I don't see it as detriment at all. I see it as more, um, the ability to show every side and show it in a way that's understandable. Thank you. Next question. Hi, Mark Lipsitz from Harvard School of Public Health. Thanks for a great panel. Uh, I uh, wanted to pick up on sort of a theme that Michaelin raised and, and some of you have also touched on about the question of sort of reporting the public health authorities' good advice versus questioning what the motives and justification behind that are. So if it's vaccines, probably everybody in the room agrees there's a, a valid point of view and an and a invalid point of view. Uh, and you may, may choose to report both, but you're not going to give them equal time. At the other extreme, with some of the public health authorities in New York and New Jersey doing silly things, maybe not, maybe they didn't agree with them, but they did them, the public health people, uh, and quarantining for Ebola, then it's clear that you can present a critique. Right. And I'm curious about the kind of middle ground where there's legitimate, there seems to be legitimate disagreement, but it's hard probably to tell what that is. And the example I would give is maybe the importance of agriculture and antibiotic resistance, which many people think is absolutely central and some people think is quite the opposite. <laughs> but, but you don't have to take that example. Just how do you, how do you mediate between trying to pass on good public health advice and being independent and questioning? Um, my job mm -hmm. is not to do the job of the CDC, mm -hmm. right? So the CDC, when you talk to them about flu, it's like, get your flu shot, here's why vaccines are important. That's fine. Buy but an that's, ad. Right, buy an ad, right? Yeah. I'm not part of your team. My team is to our readers and the mission of our news organization, which is independent. Um, yes, I will write about, but I, I, so my take will be, well, what is, what is going on with flu this year? Is there something about the vaccine? How are you going to do your public messaging this year to, to capitalize on this really bad flu season? And, and you know, what is, what is new? I will include, for example, separately as a separate story, here's a Q&A, what you need to know about flu this year. I mean, I did one last year because flu is so bad. And a lot of that was taken from the CDC website and talking to doctors. That was basically, you know, when you should get your shot and different kinds of shots. But in terms of reporting, um, that will depend on what I independently judge to be the news and what's reliable. Antibiotics in, in agriculture, huge, huge thing, huge, huge deal. But to get to that story, is much harder because that data is not public. The agricultural industry is not going to say, hey, let me, let me show you how much, how much we give to the pigs. And 
to, to, to really get at it is, is, is very, very hard. Uh, as, and, and that's probably why you don't see as, as much of it. And it takes a lot of time so we and a lot covering, of FOIAs. We end up not covering those issues for the most part. There are one or two. Maren McKenna has done. Yeah, she's done terrific for Right, right. Can I just ask, Mark, are you in the, it's not that big a yeah, deal? Yeah, I'm on the not, it's not yeah, that yeah, big a okay. deal. Yeah, yeah, OK. Well, let's talk. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I, I don't think In the developed I, world, at least. Sorry? At least in the developed world. OK. I don't have a good answer for you. I mean, I think I understand what you're talking about. And, um, I can think of another example, like uh, maybe about 10 years ago, there was a, maybe New York Magazine did a piece, I can't remember where it was, but it was a, somebody did a magazine piece on how bad flu shots were. And it was kind of before everybody else embraced the notion of how bad flu shots were, and I was like scandalized because it, it seemed like, how, you know, irresponsible. But now I'm kind of where that, the, the writers of that piece were then. So, you know, sometimes your understanding of things evolves. Yeah. And the more people you talk to, you don't end up always in this place you were in when you started. So, like in journalism, the deadline has come. Uh. Or 800 <laughs> words are written. <laughs> Sorry, I can't take your last question. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to hand it back over. First of all, let's thank our panelists, of course. Okay, that, that was terrific. Thank you all for that. And, and Micheline, thank you for joining us from San Francisco. Thank you. Um, getting up, well, not that early, I guess, but still. <laughs> it's always a risk of when you're out in the West Coast. Um, we have two more quick things. One is I'm going to turn it over to our colleagues from the Petrie Film Center, uh, who's going to offer, Carmel is going to offer a few closing uh, sort of summary thoughts. And then last but certainly not least uh, is the executive director of the Shornstein Center, Seti Warren, uh, my former mayor. Uh, who is going to come up in a few minutes and, and offer some closing remarks. So if you guys just hang out for another five, ten minutes and then we'll wrap up. Thank you very much. So hello everyone. I understand that I am standing between you and the rest of your day, which is no doubt busy, but my name is Carmel Shahar. I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for health law policy, biotechnology, and bioethics. I say that to indicate how broad our mandate is. If you've enjoyed this event, I highly suggest that you check out our website. You can Google us to find it and sign up for our newsletter so you can get a sense of all of the events we have. Last year, we had 10 conferences in one semester. This semester won't be as busy, but it will be busy. I was asked to give some concluding thoughts and this issue is near and dear to my heart because although I work in health policy, my mother is a professor who teaches mass communications. So issues around trustworthiness and how do you engage an audience and how do you craft a message have been always flying around my house. I think the term brave new world is too often overused, but that seemed to be a theme that recurred here time and time again that we're facing challenges with new business models and new voices that seem to take on a mantle of authority even when they shouldn't. And how do we sort through that as consumers who need to be able to understand the news to understand if there is an outbreak going on or what sort of health issues are facing us, but also as people who are stakeholders in the healthcare system, in the media space, to correctly highlight the information that is trustworthy and should be relied on. I hope this has given you some food for thought. It is part of Outbreak Week, which our colleagues at the Harvard Global Health Institute have done an amazing job of pulling together. The event tomorrow is going to be on vaccines, which I think has a lot of overlap. Certainly, we started talking about it time and time again today. So I hope you will join us there. Before I let you go, I would like to turn this over to my colleague, Seti Warren, who is the executive director of the Shorenstein Center, as well as an amazing person. Seti, I followed your most recent campaign very closely, so it's nice to meet you in person. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Um, I will be very brief. I. Um, as I listened to the panel discussion, uh, the, recent, the one that just happened, it took me back to 2014, 
during the Ebola break outbreak. Um, I was the mayor of Newton at that time. And there was a possibility that someone from Newton um, had the Ebola virus. And we were contacted by the CDC. And we had some really serious decisions to make uh, in informing the public. So we immediately pulled together our team and started gathering the facts. I was very lucky. Our, the head of public health for Newton happened to be a doctor and expert around infectious diseases. I didn't plan it that way. Uh, but we worked through what the facts were. And I remember the Newton tab had an editor and two reporters at the time, and we were preparing to sit down with the Newton tab, our local newspaper. And we were also preparing to sit down with Globe West. There was a reporter that, from the Boston Globe that covered Newton to make sure that the public had sound information within a 24-hour cycle. Needless to say, the individual did not turn out to have Ebola, and we did not have to go through a series of actions to inform the public in, in, in a vigorous way. But I want to fast forward to January 1st of this year when I walked out of the mayor's office. Currently, uh, the Newton tab went from two reporters and an editor and a publisher to one reporter covering multiple communities. Globe West does not exist. They have reporters that report in uh, regionally. And you have a proliferation of social media, Twitter, Facebook, that really existed but did not uh, penetrate the public the way it does today. If we had had that scenario today that I described to you, I can tell you right now uh, there's no way that we would have been able to get sound information out to people. There would have been misinformation uh, put out by people intentionally or unintentionally, and the public would have made decisions uh, not based on fact through journalism, uh, but through rumor and innuendo and all the rest. That's why I think this discussion today is so important, and we've got to continue it. Um, now I'm on the other side of the of the uh, the table here, being at the Shorenstein Center, executive director, where we are concentrating. The reason why I joined the Shorenstein Center, I understand this. We are concentrating on giving journalists, newsrooms the tools to discern what is misinformation, disinformation, or not, and the facts. That's one of the things I know you heard from uh, Cameron and Heidi and Oshka a little earlier today and Jim. Um, and we also have to make sure we're building uh, new models, business models for journalism, so that we have journalists on the ground. Um, I described Newton with one reporter, not just covering Newton, but multiple uh, cities and towns. This is happening all over the state of Massachusetts. I saw it in the last year. It's happening all over the country. Uh, so what can we do? We can, we can collaborate, work together, cross-pollinate, um, and uh, make sure that this, th this conversation continues. We have the best ideas uh, to protect the public, protect facts, uh, so that we can make good, sound decisions um, in all of our communities. Thank you so much. It's great to be here with all of you. I hope you had a great day today. Thank you. That was awesome.